Texting is something that most of us do every day, and usually without a second thought. When we do think of texting, we often think of it as antithetical to community, maybe because people do it at the dinner table, or in a crowded lecture hall when you're trying to pay attention. Um, Um, anyway, what, what was I talking about? Um, we're here today talking about community. And we've had so many examples of communities in action making the world a better place. Unfortunately, for my talk, I don't think we're going to text our way to a better world. But for better or for worse, there is a lot of texting going on in the world. Every day, our species sends 23 billion SMS messages. 40 billion iMessages, 30 billion on WhatsApp, and that's not counting Facebook Messenger, Google Hangouts, Grindr, Tinder, or Snapchat. All of these apps have different icons, but the basic value proposition is the same, sending words to other people. As technology moves on, digital instant communication is becoming an increasingly important part of our lives. All of us walk around every day with an invisible digital community in their pockets. And today, I'd like to make the invisible visible. So I started getting interested in this when I discovered that all of the text messages in my iPhone live in a plain old database, just the same as the ones I work with every day. I'm a software engineer with a degree in anthropology, um, which is a, ta a talk of its own. <laughs> um, but as a result, I'm incredibly interested not only in databases, but in quantifying human interactions. So this was a really in incredibly exciting kind of data to have access to. Um, I downloaded the database from my phone, uh, plugged it into my computer, and this is what I found. Uh, interestingly enough, that Verizon wireless text message was sent five years ago yesterday. So I have exactly five years of this data. The first thing about this data that struck me was just how much of it there was. Uh, in five years, I've sent and received 419,156 text messages, which is a lot. And I immediately turned to the internet to find out if this is normal. <laughs> And it's not. <laughs> the study I found classified heavy textures as people who send over 50 messages a day. I doubled that. For five years, I've sent a text message every six and a half minutes. Sent or received. <laughs> other people bear some of the blame. But that was the other interesting part of this. I've, I've sent 231,368 text messages in those five years. I've only received 187,788 in return. This raises a really important research question, which is, who is not texting me back? <laughs> and it's Tim. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. Uh, no, but I started to think that maybe looking at, looking at this in, in terms of number of texts was not the way to do it, right? Um, I do a thing where I'll, I'll send out a whole series of texts in a row, and like these seven probably took me under 30 seconds, right? I have friends who do the opposite, and, and this is fine. Um, I, I, I don't hate paragraphs. Um, I will just say that like, if you're going to send short texts, don't use periods because it makes you look angry. <laughs> now, in the days of unlimited texting plans, I think we've all sort of shortened the messages we send. Um, I'll, my, an actor friend of mine calls this texting the beats, right? You, you type out a thought, you hit send, you send another one, lather, rinse, repeat until, until it's all out. Um, texting is a conversational form, right? People don't talk in complete sentences. Texting is an email. In the year 2016, all of the punctuation we need are the bubbles on our screens. So I took a look at the number of, of texts that I've sent, sorry, the number of words in all the texts that I've sent, and it's, it's a huge number, too. It's 2,503,002. Um, of those, I personally have sent 1,090,833, and just for reference, the entire works of Shakespeare are 835,997. Um, this made me feel much better, first of all, because my friends text me a lot more words than I text them. And second of all, because I am, in, in fact, an incredibly prolific writer. <laughs> like, how long did it take Shakespeare to get up there? I did this in five years. <laughs> so I started to wonder, OK, I'm texting a lot, clearly. I'm spending a lot of my time on this. Who am I sending these messages to? And this was a really interesting research question, because all the conversations I've had in five years are in, in my phone, 
you know, from buying chairs on Craigslist to my closest friends. And just from personal experience, I know that I text the people I care about most more than everyone else. So what I was hoping would come out of this was an objective measure of who my best friends are. I could resolve a question that's been plaguing me since the third grade. <laughs> so I typed in this query, and I did the math, and uh, my most texted person in the last five years is my ex-boyfriend, Michael, who is no longer a part of my life. Um, and let me just say, if you try this at home, and maybe don't try this at home, find a good therapist. <laughs> Make sure they're covered under your insurance. <laughs> um, there are a couple people on this list, actually, who are no longer a part of my life. Andrew is another ex. Um, some of them are, are incredibly important to me still. Annie is over there in the third row. And, um, but this was, this was kind of a, a strange thing to find out, is that this, this measure of what I thought was going to be my community is actually you know, from a historical data set. Um, the, the pattern of the community on my phone changes over time. So I thought, OK, what if there was a way that we could measure how that community changes over time? And there's not. So you can all go home. <laughs> no, um, this is what's called a stream graph. Uh, on the x-axis here, you have time. Uh, on the y-axis, you have number of texts. And they're all color-coded by the conversation. Um, so there's three pieces of data here, right? Time, there's, there's when, there's who, and there's how much. This is the kind of data that the NSA calls metadata. And it's incredibly personal data. Um, just from the shape of this graph, you can see several events in my life. Um, around the turn of 2012, I was living in Buenos Aires, so I was texting less, only when I was back home. Um, at the end of 2013, I decided that it would, be, it would make my, my life more zen to get one of those 12-key T9 flip phones um, with no apps on it. And as you can see, this was a life choice that stuck. I've never looked back, and I've never touched the smartphone again. <laughs> Um, the bump that you see in late 2015 is something I like to call the Tinder spike of, uh, of 2015. <laughs> the rebound is a real thing. And it's statistically significant. So what can we see from this graph? Obviously, the community on my phone changes over time. Some of these people are, are my closest friends. If I'm texting you a lot, it follows that I'm very close to you. But the reverse is not always true. This is my grandmother. She's an incredibly important person in my life. Um, when I was 10, she took me on a road trip to Holland, Michigan, which was one of the highlights of my, my childhood. We stayed at the Hampton Inn, and they had free soap. I was so excited. <laughs> and um, I have never texted her back. In her 86 years, she sent me three text messages. And there's, there's a very specific reason for this. And it has nothing to do how I, with how I feel about her. We're still very close. We travel together. She's been very accepting of me as, as an adult gay man. Um, she doesn't see very well. So when she texts, I call back. And, and this is a relationship that you won't see reflected in my text messages at all. For people who don't text very much, um, this, these graphs can look very different. Uh, this is my mom. Um, she texts three people, me, my stepdad, and my sister. Um, that little green blip over there is a group message with me and my sister. <laughs> she tells me that other is mostly the dog walker. Um, my mom has a huge community of friends. She's, she's incredibly social, and it's just not a part of her life to text with them. Um, so I wanted to look at one more graph. And for this one, I chose one of my friends. Um, and I was worried about this because Annie is, is my third most texted, right? And how embarrassing would it be if I was like her 52 or something <laughs> like that? Uh, so we ran the graph, and uh, it looks like this. <laughs> Bye, Denise. <laughs> Sorry. And, and what are we to make of this, right? Like, am I, am I really to assume that I'm five times more important to Annie than Kate is? <laughs> I, I would love to say that, but I don't, I don't think so. I, I think what this graph says clearly is that Annie and I text a lot. All right, so we're looking for community in texting. And this is a tricky proposition, because what we're dealing with is data, and data is very precise. Community is a very nebulous thing. It's imprecise. And I think what you have to do to find community in texting is to break down what a community is. A community is a group of people who you laugh with.
A community is a group of people with whom you can share your most intimate emotions. In all seriousness, though, I've had incredibly intimate conversations over text message. I think sometimes it's easier to have certain conversations when you can type out what you want to say and craft your phrasing to articulate the nuances of what you want to express. Texting has also been a forum for me to talk about the things in my life that are most important to me. <laughs> and my favorite thing about this graph is that, I mean, clearly Sunday night is a big pizza time for me and my friends, <laughs> but not at 8 p.m. And the only explanation I can come up with for this is that our, our hands are so covered in pepperoni grease that we just can't hold our phones at all. I don't know. I mean, this is wide open for, for, for further analysis. I have one more story and then I'll close. What texting, I think, allows us to do is to stay in touch in a way that other forms of communication don't. These are my friends Will and Hannah. We met in Buenos Aires when I was traveling there. And uh, Hannah moved to Edinburgh after, after we left, and Will went back to Vancouver. I moved back here. We stayed in touch over the, the ensuing years, and we see each other every year or two. But we also stay in touch, first on WhatsApp and now in a group iMessage. And we stay in touch in a way that we couldn't through any other medium, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Will's on Pacific time, so he's up later. If, I have, if I'm texting in, in the early morning, Hannah's on Greenwich Mean Time. At any moment of the day, I can contact them and maintain an intimate friendship in a way that I never could if we relied on email or worse yet, writing letters. So what, what does this leave us with? Texting is increasingly a part of our lives, and I think we have the responsibility to do it well. It's a written form. And while it has the reputation of being a distraction or a forum in which meaning is lost and nuance is is ignored. I think we have to take responsibility for being good writers when we text. When we do, we use the same English language that William Shakespeare did. And while I'm not asking you to text an iambic pentameter, I think we can all do a little more to craft the words we use and communicate better with each other. <laughs> Texting is not going to save the world but it might just help us talk to one another, to the people who matter to us most. Thank you. All right, I got one more thing. Um, <laughs> Rest in peace, Steve Jobs. Um, I have barely scratched the surface here of what is possible with this data set. If you're interested by anything you've seen today, if you have other ideas, other questions, if you just want to see what your graphs look like, please send me a message. Um, I'd be really happy to hear from you. And don't call me. My voicemail isn't even set up. <laughs> Thank you.